All right. So hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our first Africa of a Coffee event this year. Um, my name is Debbie Abois. I'm the chair of uh, Africa of a Coffee uh, for this school year. Um, for those of you who are new to it, Africa Over Coffee is essentially a forum birthed out of the African Society of Cambridge University. Um, it's dedicated to the discussion of issues relevant to the African continent. We're just going to ask everybody to mute themselves when they enter. Okay. So, uh, yes, this is basically a forum birthed out of the African Society of Cambridge University uh, dedicated to the, to the discussion of um, all issues relevant to the African continent. Um, we regularly have speakers join us on various topics, and today we're thrilled to have the renowned um, Aisha Yasufu joining us. Um, we're so excited. This has been something we've been looking forward to, especially um, in this climate of what's happening right now during the NSAS movement that has essentially taken Nigeria and the world by storm. Um, so for those who just need kind of a brief background on what this movement started as, um, it basically started as a series of protests led by the youth um, against the atrocities that have been carried out by the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, or SARS. Um, and basically, these youths were going out on the street demanding for its complete dissolution in all forms. Um, the protests brought in to include uh, demands for reform in governance, um, and have called out the corruption being seen in the Nigerian leadership. So as I'm sure most of us know, all of this kind of culminated in the Lucky Tollgate massacre just last month on the 20th, which saw several peaceful protesting civilians um, get shot by military officials. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've seen that in the continuing violence in other parts of the country. And I mean, I think I speak for everyone in saying that it was, uh, it was quite heart wrenching, um, especially since we had followed the peaceful protests with a lot of pride from all corners of Africa, um, basically marveling at how organized and efficient um, people had been with um, just donating, getting out, organizing, um, and just seeing how efficient organizations like the Feminist Coalition have been um, throughout this period. So I'm just going to ask Madame Aisha to come in and introduce herself. I know a lot of people already know who she is. Um, and we've been following her and her commentary on what's happening. We've been seeing her out on the streets herself. Um, and I'm sure, like, like me, many of you have been praying for her safety um, throughout this period. Um, so yes, Madam Aisha, if you could just come in. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure being here uh, with you all today. Uh, my name is Aisha Yusufu. I am and I am an active Nigerian citizen. Basically, for me, that's just uh, that's just uh, the, the 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 two liner. And the fact is that uh, I just feel that uh, we all need to speak up. And uh, I've always been like this all my life. And uh, I make demands. I, I just feel uh, we 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 have a uh, a duty to to not just be okay for ourselves, but also to speak up for others who do not, who are not fortunate enough to have either the education. Uh, that we have or have the, the kind of life uh, that, that we have. And it's very important that at all, all times we ensure that uh, we get a nation actually where the child of nobody can become somebody without knowing anybody. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today I think we're going to kind of let this be um, 
focused on our participants. Um, I'm just going to ask a few questions at the beginning, but for the most part, I'd like our audience to speak. I think, I think a lot of people have been frustrated seeing some of the recent things happening. A lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, kind of are unsure of where we should go from here. Um, so I would, I would really just ask foundationally, what, what has um, differentiated this NSAS movement? from previous youth-driven movements in Nigeria. Um, how, how is this different? Um, so, so what has uh, differentiated this uh, movement from other previous movements is the fact that this movement is actually a, mo uh, a, a protest of survival. Mm. And so the other protests that we normally have are usually protests of empathy, where mm. you see something happen and then you just you know you need to empathize you are out there you're making the minds and it was florence also that actually you know explained this in, in the way that it was like oh yeah because most of the victims most of the people who came out to protest are actually either victims mm -hmm. some of them have been victims many times over or they have loved ones who who are who were either victims or are currently still victims and and so uh, it brought a lot of people and people have been tired, especially with, with the youth. Normally, uh, the youth in Nigeria, it, it, it takes a lot for you to even get their attention. Their attention spam is, is very uh, little. They come out on social media, it takes about 24 to 48 hours, everything fizzled out, and then they go on with what they're doing. And I remember when, you know, when sometimes when people are like, oh, the youth are so focused on inanities, on things that don't matter. I'm like, it's a coping mechanism for them because a lot of them want something that will just take their attention away from all the things that are going on. And just hearing the stories that have continuously come out is so amazing, the culture of silence that we have over the police brutality. Uh, itself and a lot of people were being systematically abused by by the system by the state and they were going through so much and most people uh, didn't speak out most people were not even seeking for help uh, you, you see in, in terms of what we are talking about abuses uh, the, the police brutality has mainly been more on on the young male adults and you know, in the African society where you are asked to chin up and just take everything in, you're a man, you, men don't cry and all of that. And nobody bothered about this whole pain that they had locked up. Because it's, it, when, you, when you hear them speaking, you could feel the pain that are, when they're reliving their experiences, knowing fully well that most of them are probably dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and they've never had any therapy or anywhere to, to, to be able to take it away. So this was what made it different, uh, different from other protests because people were coming out. This is something that affected people passionately in terms of fighting for their lives because you have a situation whereby the police were killing people, they were maiming people, they were terrorizing people, extorting people, and there was nowhere to run to because the same people you are supposed to run to are actually the ones who are, are terrorizing and they extorting the, the people. And over time, it had, it had been happening. I mean, I think it was around 2017 or 18 that uh, a protest was called NSAS protest. Not many people turned up. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that but at that, on that day, the po po police had their own process protest and they brought in lots and lots of people. And so it, it just went on in that way. People just kept on with the pain. But repeatedly, you keep hearing of these killings that have been going on. And the recent one, of course, are when uh, a young man was killed in Portacot, a young man who is uh, just 20, uh, and the police asked to see his phone, and he said, no, he wasn't going to show his phone, and because of that, he was killed. And a uh, few weeks after that, again, in, uh, this happened in Potakot, in the south, south, southern state uh, uh, region of Nigeria, and then a few weeks after that, in Ugeli, same south, in Delta State, uh, south, southern region of the, of the country, uh, a young man was also shot by police, and he started taken away, and you know, the, the citizens, the youth of Ugeli just came out and they were so tired of it all. And this sort of like spiraled around the, the country and the people were, were, were just on it. But most importantly, one of the things that really made it different, it's the organization that came in with the feminist coalition and the fact that the young people were able to come together put themselves together, work with cohesion, and have so much organization and structure in place within very short, uh, very short time. Uh, and it just 
sort of like awakening the youth that had heated to just be uh, on their own, not even interested in, in the governance and what was happening in Nigeria. But right now, uh, it, it's, it's a different thing altogether. Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see that. Um, I think that, you know, especially looking at the feminist coalition, it's been so amazing seeing the accountability. I mean, so many people have commented that, you know, these same youth who have come and organized, I mean, given food out, raised money for people on the streets, you know, accounted for every cent donated. Um, these are the very people who should be leading the country, who should be, you know, taking the reins. And I mean, what, what, what do you think fundamentally needs to be done for reform in leadership? I mean, because it seems it's very secular. Somebody gets into power, they bring their friends on board, they bring, bring their family on board, they fund each other. I mean, how do we break out of that cycle? How can we get some of these fresh new voices in the places they need to be? Uh, so, uh, you know, ironically, just about 30 minutes ago before, before we started this uh, program, I was speaking with my husband and we were just discussing and I said, any government worth its salt would have looked at these NSAS protesters, especially from the feminist coalition, and look at how to bring them into government for them to, to get the work done. Because being in leadership position, it's not rocket science. You don't need to know everything. All you need to do is to get a formidable team a team that can get the job done and then get them, give, give them the vision and watch them run with it while you supervise and ensure uh, things are, are being done. But unfortunately, we, we have people who are not interested in, in good governance, who are not interested in merit and uh, 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 ability to do things well, but they are more interested in nepotism. And so they keep on perpetrating this uh, uh, bad governance that, that, that we have. But, but one of the things I, I, I would say is the fact that for, for us to be able to get the right people into office, citizens need to care. Citizens need to care for themselves and the citizens need to understand their role in governance. Mm -hmm. Governance, uh, according to Dr. Obezekwesili, is made up of two, two sides. We have the demand side and also the supply side. The supply side of governance is by those whom, uh, who, who are voted into office, while the demand side is by the citizens. Unfortunately, many, many people do not take part in, the, in, 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 in governance at all. They just vote for those who vote and that's it. They forget about it. So it's very important to hold those in office accountable to demand for transparency, uh, for there to be evaluation and monitoring, and also demand for good governance. And uh, this is what our citizens are supposed to do. And when, wherever you find a situation whereby somebody is not giving good governance, what usually should happen is that that person should not be rewarded with another term in office. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. There's no how you reward failure and mediocrity and expect that when that uh, failure and mediocrity is rewarded, that they're going to do better just because you, you, you rewarded them again. No, they're only going to uh, get uh, uh, worse. So part of the things that we need to do, and you know, thinking about how did we even get here, is the fact that we need to focus six things I'm going to talk about. Lack of empathy is the reason why we're here. We need to begin to look at leaders who actually give, um, who are empathetic, who care about what happened to their people. Not people who speak when it is convenient, people who speak when it is needed. We have to, uh, many of us lack uh, understanding of our shared humanity and social contract with government. And so we do not realize what government is supposed to do. Uh, we have three refusal, like I mentioned earlier, ref people refusing to occupy their office of the citizen and then misplaced anger from a lot of people. So you find out that people are angry at those who are fighting for their rights, those who are demanding that they, they be given good governance rather than people who are giving them uh, bad governance. Uh, the fifth one, of course, is our short-term memory. Uh, when people come in during election, we forget all what they have been doing, the fact that they were never there for the people, all the things that they have said, people forget that. And then uh, ref refusal to take part in governance also uh, plays uh, a, a very important role. And so all of these are the things that we need to begin to, to, to ensure that we tackle so that going forward, we begin to put our left, uh, our best foot forward, have the best uh, amongst us be in governance. And I think it's, it's Plato who, who that said that uh, when you do not take part in politics, where you, 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 you allow the worst to be the ones to lead. And right now, sadly, that's what we have. Hmm. Wow, that was very thorough. Thank you. Um, okay, so keeping that in mind, 
um, what do you think we should, so, so not even just focusing on Nigerian citizens, but let's widen that a little bit and look at other African citizens, um, other African nations and governments, um, and perhaps even the international community. What should we expect from them? Or, you know, from some of us, I'm not Nigerian, I'm Ghanaian. Um, but I've been waiting for ECOWAS to make a strong statement. I've been looking at our president and wondering why it took him so long to say something. Um, and I've been kind of here saying, you know, apart from donating, what can I, what can I do? Um, yeah. Uh, so, 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 so basically, uh, when, when you look at Africa as a continent, it's almost like it's a country because whenever you're talking about some of these issues and then, you're another country in Africa, they're talking about it, you're thinking, it, that's almost a replica of what we are going through. Earlier today, I was, I was on, on, a, on a program uh, with, with some Kenyans, and I had to say to them, what you're saying, you know, we're talking about police brutality, and I said to them, it feels as if you're describing what's happening in my country. And so, one of the things we have is, is the fact that the, 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 the people in, or in, in governance, they, they know how to bond together. They know how to put aside their differences mm -hmm. to ensure that they continue to perpetuate themselves in, in office. That's one of the things that the citizens have not been able to do. The mm -hmm. citizens hold on to their differences, and which is one of the good things about the NSAT uh, movement and protests. They were able to put aside their differences and come together and just work uh, for, for the singularity of, of purpose. So this is what they do. So they, they all have each other's back. So you're not going to see the Ghanaian uh, president come out and speak uh, harshly uh, uh, to the Nigerian president or say something. No, he's going to be diplomatic. He's going to, uh, you know, put it in, in a nice way that he doesn't ruffle feathers because at the end of the day, they've got each other's back. More or less, they are all into this, the, the same thing. And they, 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 they have to uh, protect each other's uh, uh, stay in, in office. So you, uh, you will never see Africa Union coming out and putting its foot together. Neither will you see ECOWAS also doing that. And I, I mean, so in, in the International uh, co 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 uh, Committee of Nations, it's almost as if when uh, bad things are being done, there's this, um, this issue of just playing the ostrich and just looking and just and just look the other way because at the end of the day uh, there's really no need to 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 come down hard on 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 anyway it's almost like this uh club that people are just going uh, and and nobody wants to ruffle any further everybody's trying to be di diplomatic and also be political so we've really not seen uh much that that has that has come out of uh from the international uh, uh, was. But there are some individuals who are actually have said one or two things, and that, that has really helped because sadly we have a nation that listens more to the voices from outside than it does uh, to the voices uh, from within. And I think one of the things that is most uh, instructive is, is, is the fact that uh, the youth are waking up, not just in Af Nigeria, but uh, around uh, other parts of Africa and also around the, the world. And, and they're tired of the things that, that are going on. And we need to understand that there's a different era, there's a different age, there's a different order. I mean, COVID-19 has more than emphasized uh, that. And they, 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 they are working uh, in, in such a way that they're able to organize, they can do so many things. I mean, technology is there, they own the, 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 the world of technology and they can do so many things. And I think, that's part of the things uh, that government should, be, should take into uh, 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 cognizance, the fact that it's no longer business as usual, it is now business unusual, and you have uh, social media, and social media has ensured that media is democratized, so people get to see what is happening all over the world, and so it's not before where only you only got to see what was happening within your community or within your state and at best within your country but right now people get to see what is happening and then people are making more demands they're saying if the youth in this country can get this why can't we the youth in our own country uh, get this and it th th this is really uh, taking the world, world on but i would say that for those who are always asking what is it that they can do is to keep amplifying the issue help mm -hmm. us talk your government, your parliament. I mean, there's always that foreign policy uh, that uh, nations have. Uh, ensure that this issue, it's, it's tabled, it's made, it made an issue. Situation whereby uh, uh, military will be deployed to just shoot down uh, people protesters who had nothing other than the flag, flag of their country and were singing national uh, anthem, something that should make the whole world 
be aghast at such a such thing happening. And it should be condemned in strong words. And mm. sanctions that need to be put in place should actually be put in place. Hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, I think that this is definitely a very strong word, especially to, I mean, from what I'm seeing, Nigerians who are trying to suddenly flee the country because of what is happening, you know, I'm, I'm seeing there's kind of a mass exodus to Canada in particular. Um, I have, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to several people about this and I guess there's, there's just been this feeling of hopelessness um especially following the lucky massacre um i mean what what would you say to people who feel leaving the country is a solution or it's preferable to being silenced um, um well uh, for me for me uh, I, i'm a very pragmatic person and, and i always say for those who feel that they need to leave the country well it's good they, they can't leave the country and be able to to get a better life out there and then probably come back later or find a voice out there and speak out. Because in the end, and I, I think I forgot to mention this, in this end sub protest, the, the Nigerians in diaspora really played a huge role and I, I, it made all the difference. And uh, so it, it's it, it's very important uh, in, in that way for those uh, who feel the need. But one of the things I'll, I'll remind us all is, is, the, fact, is the fact that um, we are 220 million people or more than there's no there are no nations that we accommodate all of us so mm -hmm. even if you're going you can't go with all your family you can't go with all your friends you can't go with all your colleagues you can't go with all your uh, uh local government uh, you know you can't go with everyone so it's very important at the same time for us to think of uh fixing our country and the only way we can fix our country is by fixing politics fixing politics in a way that we get the right people uh in, in into governance and, and I always say that the Nigerians in diaspora, they have such a huge influence. They remit over $20 billion back home. And that's about, about almost 4% 4, 4 of the GDP of the, of the nation. And you can't have this much economic contributing economically and not and be powerless when it comes to politics. And they need to have a political power. The Nigerians in diaspora need to begin to uh, fight for a right for them to be able to vote in, in our election. This APC government, that was part of the things it promised them in 2015, and it's already uh, five years uh, after. So it, that, will, that will help, help to in the fact that they have a circle of influence. Uh, they, if they're voting, nobody is going to intimidate them uh, mm -hmm. with uh, DSS security agents. Nobody is going to buy their vote. Weapon. There's no poverty to be weaponized or illiteracy to be weaponized. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they are known, their numbers are known, they can be, they can be counted. So this, this is huge. Baby, going back to the, the question also that, that, that you've asked, is the fact that one of the things I, I want, I always tell Nigeria, so no matter where you are, if Nigeria is not working fine, forget about it. You're, you're not going to have it easy. There's a difference between when you are in Nigeria, for example, let's use Canada as an example. Somebody has dual citizenship and the person is Nigerian Canadian. A Nigerian Canadian is different from a British Canadian. Why? Because British uh, UK is also developed. So when they see a British Canadian, the thing they are going to do is that, oh, they are there because of they want to. It's a choice. But when they see you a Nigerian Canadian and they look at the uh, Nigeria you're coming from, it's not as developed as it should be. It's, it's, uh, it's operating below uh, optimum, below capacity, below everything that is expected of it. They're going to look at you and think that, oh, you are here because you you're there because you have to be there. You're yes. not there out of choice. So there's that difference in fighting and having that Nigeria that works for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I always say this, black lives would not matter until Africa gets its act together, until mm -hmm. Africa gets to a place of economic empowerment, until Africa takes its place in, 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 the, in the committee of nations, not as a beggar or, some, or, or a, a continent that needs uh, handouts, no, but as a continent that is prosperous, that it's rich, then nobody is going to look down on, on the color of our skin. The reason why they're looking down the color, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It mm. has everything to do with the economics, the, the, the pocket that, that, that you have. And so we need to begin to work on getting our country. It's not to say that, oh, the, the, the easiest thing is to run away. I mean, for me, it saddens me a lot when I see, you know, uh, Africans, and this most especially Nigerians, you know, traveling through seas and oceans and deserts to be able to get to Europe. And I just say, I just imagine 
all our ancestors who were taken away as slaves on ships, who were forced, there were some who, who, who rather committed suicide than to be taken away. For them to, to know that either their descendants or uh, the descendants of their own people ended up uh, now, be, now being the ones trying to get over to, to Europe by all means and actually risking their, their, their lives, it, 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 it's almost a heinous thing to, to think about. And I think uh, we need to do better and we have to start it by, act, like I said earlier, fixing our politics. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think at this point, I'm actually going to open it up to the audience to ask questions. Um, let's please remember to be respectful as we are commenting. Um, but if you can just raise your hand, um, then I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay, I see Ozzy. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead, Ozzy. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, first of all, um, I'm really enjoying the talk. So thank you so much for putting on this event at school. And also, obviously, thank you to the speaker for coming. Um, my question is mainly on, do you think we can really reform the politics in Nigeria um, or do you think we need to come up with a new way? Because I feel like we're trying to force a system that doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we take more questions, please, so that then I'll just. Oh, okay. So. Um, okay. I see Oying Council. Sorry, if I if I butcher the name, please forgive me. Uh, go ahead. That's okay, Oyin Kosola. I think you're calling me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. My question is about the role for um, those of us in the diaspora, and what can we do? How can we keep the momentum up? What can we do um, in the absence of the fact that we can't vote? How can we put pressure on the government for that to to happen? Do you think? Because I think we have a, a great um, energy right now and it's important to keep that momentum up thank you thank you um okay can we have chidi chidi Bere? sorry hello can you hear me yes please yes we can hello okay um, it seems your sound is has gone off. Gone off. Um, can, you hear me, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay. Uh, my question is this. Um, good evening to start with. Mm -hmm. and, um, I must commend you people, especially Madam Aisha and everybody in diaspora. God bless you all for this struggle. And um, I want to ask, since after this NSAS protest, what has really changed? What has really changed? We are still, we hardly sleep at night. Most time, you see people, they come around with vehicles. You don't know whether they are cops, you don't know whether they are policemen. You're always in fear. I want to ask, what has really changed? What is the way forward? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll take. Okay, I think, yeah. Okay, you want to take more. Would you like to take more, or, or let's take it three at a time? I think so that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me go. Thank you so much uh, for those uh, who called in to ask questions. Uh, so the, the, the first uh, uh, said, uh, do you think we can really reform the politics in Nigeria? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things that. Uh, Nelson Mandela said it is impossible or, or, until it is done, and I totally uh, believe him. Uh, things might look as if they're not going to change, as if it's not going to work, but we get it done. I remember in 2015, a lot of people felt that uh, an incumbent cannot be defeated in Nigeria, but citizens rallied together and they got it done. The most important thing is to have the belief that we can and then begin to work towards it. Uh, it was uh, Henry Ford that said, if you think you can, you can. 
If you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you're right. And I think uh, what happens is the fact that, first of all, there's, there's an organization that, that just started starting, and there's going to be a launch on the 11th of uh, November. And this organization is called Six Qualities. Uh, it, it, it was started by Dr. Obi Ezekwesili. She had run for the 2019 election. And uh, in January 2000, I think, I think 19, as she pulled out of it, looking at the system and also the party that she was in and everything, she pulled out of the presidential uh, race. And she, she said something that, look, if we don't fix politics, we won't, we won't be able to fix our nation. We won't get good governance that, that we're looking for. And that even if you have somebody with the kind of system that we have right now, it's rigged for failure. So first of all, we need to get the right kind of people into office. And fixed politics is about three, uh, three things. It's, a, it's, it's like a triangular uh, prong approach, three prong approach. So the first one is to have empowered and uh, enlightened uh, 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 an elected electorate. So first of all, let the electorate understand the power that they have, because many people don't understand the power that they have. Many people don't understand the relationship between governors and their lives, that the most of the things that they are making demands from people, that it is actually their government that is supposed to do it for them. So they need to understand that, and they need also to understand that the people are the structure. It's not the parties that have the uh, structures, it's the people. We have a situation whereby we, uh, uh, poverty has been weaponized, illiteracy has been weaponized because there are some people who use that to perpetuate themselves in office. Then it becomes mandatory for other citizens who pick up the slack. The politicians will give 5,000 Naira, 10,000 Naira, 20,000 Naira, and they get themselves four years of, of wasting our resources. Then you, as an individual, you are picking up the slack for the politician, the people that got that sold their votes for five to thousand to twenty thousand naira, you are not the one spending hundreds of thousands of naira, sometimes possibly millions in four years to take care of them without asking for anything in return. And so there's a power of circle, there's a circle of influence we all have. And this also, most especially the people in diaspora, and you, we must begin to use this power of influence to let the people know they need to make the right choices. You cannot carry people's burden, be stuck gap for government and then they're just getting away with uh, on that then the other uh, the other uh, 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 the other prong is on the right kind of people who are going to run into office we need people with competence character capacity people with compassion people with en uh, empathy people that are innovative to run for office and so not just to have anyone there and there's a need for training and so this is a, a part of the fixed policies, what they're looking at, getting the right kind of people that are going to run for offices. We must get to a place whereby we are no longer shaming people from, from running into office. In Nigeria, it's almost a crime for somebody to go into politics. People are shamed. People are asked, uh, oh, you, 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 it, it's almost as if we have an agreement that it's only criminals or people with questionable characters that should go into politics. That's not the case. It should be people who are incorruptible, people who, are, who, who have competence, people who have character that should be going uh, into office. And of course, uh, the other, the other um, is, is, to, is to focus on the regulators and ensure that there is uh, what we call the electoral reform. Electoral reform and these regulators are independent and then they, they are able to discharge their duties effectively. So when we work on all of that, we will get that uh, I will be able to reform our, our politics. It's not going to be easy, not at all. It's going to be a long time. It might not be in the next four years. It might be in the next 10 to 20 years. But the thing is that we need to start it now. We need to get people and let people understand the different arms of government and the roles they play. Most times we neglect the legislative arm of government. And that's the most important arm, arm, role in, in a democracy. It, a democracy is all about the legislative arm because even when you have military, there always the judiciary is there, the executive is there, it's the legislative arm that is never there. But yet people do not focus on getting the right people into office. Because if we have the right people, even in the legislative arm, I will be able to uh you know checkmate the uh, executive and ensure that they do what what they're supposed what they're supposed to do so 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 that's that that's what one of it then in terms of the role of uh, those in diaspora those in diaspora for now uh, i mean you don't have our military coming after you to to, to attack you 
to, to kill, to kill, to maim. Uh, people's accounts are being frozen here. People are not allowed to travel. I mean, there's a list that is purported to be out, out there, a no ban, a, a, a travel ban list that people cannot travel and every, every, everything. Uh, one of the, uh, a, a lady, uh, Modukbe was, 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 was uh, her passport was was uh, uh, taken away by 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 the immigration on her on her way out of the country and she has been denied travel. So a lot of these harassments are not there. So you could continue with the protest going on, the protest to the uh, either our uh, uh, embassies where you are or our high commission, as the case may be. Just have this protest there because the government likes optics they they, they 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 don't want to be embarrassed they want to look good and these are some of the things uh, that could be done and sure you're talking about it put it on the front banner like i said earlier uh talk to the respective uh government in, in the countries most countries that you're in uh it could be your the, the parliament it could be uh the uh what do, what do you call it now the either the legislative arm for them to take it up and talk about it because these are uh, things that are very important and then and then of course most importantly name and shame our politicians they go over there to do business they go over there to do business. ensure that you are calling them out wherever you see them it's not for them to leave the country and then go over there and have a comfortable life that they have refused to give uh, the people that are back home. There are there are quite a different proposal that people have been giving in terms of the uh, the uh, Nigerians in diaspora should be more interested in politics. We've seen what happened. These protests were primarily very were, uh, uh, successful because of the active role that was played by by feminist coalition and the fact that people came together and crowdsourced. It's very important. What we have in Nigeria today is that a lot of people going into politics, they are the ones who have to use their own money. And you can't expect people who have never looted, who people don't have those kind of money. So we all must be ready to put our money where our votes are. People should donate. The Nigerians in diaspora too should, should look into that. Nigerians in Nigeria too should be looking at that. Even if it's something as little as 500 Naira per month, that we are putting in a pot somewhere. 10 million Nigerians are put, putting that together every month. That's billions. And you'll be able to help people that who have computer character capacity uh, to get in, in, into office. And, and that would be uh, really amazing. Then the last uh, person that who spoke said, what has really changed after uh, uh, NSAS? You see uh, the despondency, people are afraid, people are being picked up, there's harassment everywhere. I would say to you, what has come out of NSAS is amazing. You see the reaction that you're getting from government. It shows that NSAS protest got to them. It got to them to a place where they normally, uh, it, it has never gotten to them in a very long time. Because normally what happens is that when people are protesting, the Nigerian government is very good at wanting, and that is to ignore the people. Mm. On this one, it couldn't ignore the people. The Nigerian youth were able to come together. They were able to come together and work in a unified manner and get things done. The, the, the whole story of what has always been said to Nigeria, oh, you cannot unite, we are different tribes, we are different religion and all of that, it was put aside. And so that's amazing. There is now an awakening, an awakening of voices. People understand what it is to be citizens. People understand the importance of being active citizens rather than just being passive citizens. And that is an amazing thing. We must never uh, uh, give, up, uh, give up on that. And you know, capacity to, 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 to make demands and be heard has been unleashed. Right now, we have panels that are going on. Uh, the federal, uh, there are states, I think are over 20 something uh, states have set up their panel. And I can see from, yes, I can really say the revolution has started. The power of the people has been unleashed and it's amazing. And so, and you can see that a lot of people are talking about 2023. A lot of people are interested in politics. People who hit it or wouldn't care, we just say to you, oh, Please forget about that one. They will probably say to you, they don't care about politics. Now they know that it matters. Now they know the importance of, 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 of good governance and the importance of having people there who, who can lead. They saw what the feminist coalition were able to do. They saw accountability and transparency. They saw how with little money that they had, how they were able to provide welfare, feed people, take care of security, take care of hospitals, bills, logistics, and all of that. Yet government that has been spending billions, you hardly ever see at the people that they have touched. So the, it's a huge awakening that we might not think uh, we, tangible, we might not think it's tangible, but it's so, so amazing. And, and and it's something that you know. Years from now, we're going to look forward. You're going to we're going to look back and say this was the defining moment where Nigeria decided 
to, to be the great nation that it was uh, always meant to be. And then also a lot of things are, have come out in terms of the government uh, are putting uh, things uh, out there uh, in terms of the five for five demands. You saw uh, the, 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 the NSAS protesters were always at the negotiating table. They have shown that they have the capacity, you'd have the capacity to make the government uh, sit up and begin to do things that it, 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 it never wanted to. And so a lot of things are, are being done. The, the, the police are within where they're training the new SWAT uh, team that, that they have. Hopefully we are watchful. But the most important thing is for Nigerians to never go back to sleep again and for, uh, for citizens to understand that evaluating and monitoring your government is your, it's a personal responsibility everybody must take uh, seriously. I see someone who is talking about, uh, who, is, who, is, who is asking what's the way forward? What are the things that uh, they're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to do? Well, there are different things being worked out. There are some already, some of these things have been ongoing. And with this one, many people are finding their niches. Where do they best fit in? Electoral reform is very important. We need to begin to uh, make a call for electoral reform because if we want to get 2023, the, 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 we need to have a, 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 an electoral reform. We need to have changes. The card reader must be uh, admissible in court. Right now, it's not admissible and it's giving room for a lot of uh, 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 toggery to happen, a lot of violence to be unleashed. And uh, we don't want a situation whereby uh, the politicians will also deploy talks the way they did deploy talks during protests. Uh, by, you saw when the politicians brought in uh, all of these protests. And already, uh, education and empowerment of youth, uh, may, so, some have already taken that on. Awareness creation is already going on for people to understand what uh, police brutality is all about, how does it affect their life, and the fact that they have a right in their nation as citizens, they are not, uh, they are not, uh, they, are, they are not slaves. And so these also have uh, uh, some, some of the things that are already uh, ongoing. People are looking at 2023, a lot, a lot of people who are those ones that are going to be put in the National Assembly, uh, in the state houses of assembly. And this, these are the things uh, that are going on. In terms of the tech, uh, how is technology helping? I'm, I'm answering some of the questions that I see uh, are being uh, written. So in terms of the uh, how tech, technology helped a lot a whole lot. When you talk about Bitcoins and all of that, because part of the things that were done, I remember when uh, Jack of Twitter actually, you know, tweeted in support of NSAS and asked people to donate using Bitcoin. It's, it's part of the things that really helped because at one time, a Flutter Wave, one of the uh, organizations that, that helped in, in, in the what in the and the fund uh, crowdsourcing that that happened, the the the, the federal uh, the central bank of Nigeria came up after them, even though that that, that was uh, uh, resolved. But it's a kind of intimidation tactics uh, that normally happens. But in 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 a way, what it did. Uh, so in, in a way, what it did w was to ensure that there was money that was being put together, funds were being raised, and they could take care of people. At one time, the government wasn't providing security anymore. The, secure, the police will bring in talks and supervise the talks to attack people and they would refuse to do nothing. So the, the NSAS uh, protesters had to get their own uh, security from private uh, organizations. So it did help. The, in terms of encrypted uh, messages and all of that, in passing information, uh, because right now all our lines are blocked. You know, they're always listening. They're always harassing. It's, it's to ensure that people are able to to, to work together, the kind of protests that are going on. Protests are still ongoing. Uh, yes, they, it might not be as the way it was then. People are just sitting on the street, but people are coming out in pockets and doing all of these protests. Uh, and some of sometimes messages, these are the way that these messages are, are being sent. They have, technology has helped a lot. Technology has, has did indeed uh, did help. Like I talked about the social media, it's an, ama it's an amazing tool for mobilization, where within very short time, you're able to call on people and people rally around uh, either whether they are donating or they're physically at, at the place of protest. Uh, a, a question is coming on on the issue of PVC. Uh, one of the things also that has uh, repeatedly uh, be, been talked about and which is being worked on is the fact that the INEC should start a registration and giving people their PVC. It's not the one that they wait till three months to election and then people are rushing, many people get discouraged. And uh, uh, today, I think it was today, earlier today, the, uh, the chairman of INEC uh, has, uh, has said that they will start registration first quarter of 2021. So that, that's something, that's a win that, that is coming out of all of this that is, that is happening and people uh, 
uh, people are, 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 are really keen in, in ensuring that they, they get their PVTs and, and get on, on, on politics. Uh, in terms of, I see another question, somebody talking about uh, uh, the fact that activism is something that is not, uh, is frowned upon by African leaders. Sadly, it is so, and most of them, you find out that they came into office through activism or through protesting or through calling out the government. The moment they get into office, they become something else. They become that thing that they used to fight. For example, the, the present president of Nigeria was always on the streets protesting. Even when he lost election, he did a protest. He, there was one he called this revolution. Today, he's in government. He's intolerant. And, you know, ironically, the, the president was the one who, who had gone to court when he was tear gas at one time with his uh, running mate uh, after they had lost election and they did some protests in the, in, the, in the state called Kano. And when they were tear gas, unfortunately, the running mate died. He went to, uh, uh, to, to court with the case. And that was when the court uh, uh, stated that we don't need permission from the police to do a protest. All we need is to inform them, give them at least 48 hours notification so that they will come and protect us, protect the citizens. And yet it's the same person who is president today, who is actually using military to come and shoot at unarmed uh, protesters. So it, it's really, uh, so it's, it's just all about having people who don't have character in office and people who have been left off for too long where the citizens are not holding them accountable. And then it seems as if uh, they, they've become so powerful, but those are the powers that need need to be to be need, and, and it's very important for us all, uh, to begin to do that, even with the, the, the Nigerians in diaspora. And I think at this moment, the Nigerians in diaspora should not just say, "Oh, it's not going to happen," but they should begin to to agitate mm -hmm. for, for 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 them to be able to take part uh, in, in election. They should be able to vote. There are millions of Nigerians in Nigerians in diaspora who are contributing up to 4% of the GDP of our country with such economic power, they also should have political power. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to take some questions from those who have ra uh, raised their hands for quite a while. So I'm going to go to Tunde and then Sharon and then Margaret. So uh, Tunde, if you can ask your question. Um, Tunde, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I want to, uh, well, <laughs> Chris, especially, is it comrade now or <laughs> activist? Aisha, you just, I have been fully. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's a privilege to have you around at this special moment and at this time. And I want to appreciate your efforts ever since and everything you've been doing. Uh, I want to mention two things in particular. We know in Nigeria we don't have strong systems, which is a problem that we've been facing all this while. But I want to say that the strong people that we need to have, it seems we don't have strong enough people at the moment. Because in Oyo states, as was popularly cited and with evidences on the social media, Twitter especially, we saw some set of youths that went to meet with the state governments and were given a bag of money which they shared. Mm. How are we going to make sure? that we have strong people, strong individuals that is going to like strengthen the weak system that we have in Nigeria presently and to make it strong going forward. And about voting for the Nigerians in diaspora, I think this is very, very crucial because at the moment if we have 10 million plus of Nigerians and if any presidential election that we've had in recent times is only one with 24 million votes. I believe we can make huge impact and change the game. And I also believe uh, with the recent protests, we know it's not going to be easy like we've seen the repercussions going on. Governors are now compensating police officers without compensating victims of police brutality. So many things going on. And sincerely, I, I, I think we just need something to change and very soon. So, to, like I've said, how do we bring strong people, build strong people to strengthen our weak systems? And how do we make sure that in 2023, I know it is doable. I know it is doable. The only thing is they're just trying to stop it so that the power don't change easily. 
how are we going to empower and make sure that Nigerians in diaspora vote in 2023 going forward? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, should I go ahead? Um, let's have Sharon ask his question. It's a her. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to say, um, so I, I've been born and raised in the UK, I'm Nigerian, um, and I also wanted to just ask, like, what would you say is the role that we here in I guess the West can play so I, I think something that I s struggle to um, um, kind of comprehend is the idea that we're perhaps not seen as the same as those that have been born and raised in the UK uh, in Nigeria or whatever the country is so and I think then does that diminish our role um, and I think in a situation like now and times like now um, would it not be more beneficial to have those who have perhaps experienced um, um, systems and, and government um, who have dealt with situations like this a lot different and would it not be helpful to have our input um, but I almost almost want to say that we're frowned upon sometimes with this and like we're not taken as seriously like um, for instance if I ever told my grandma I wanted to be the president of Nigeria, I know for a fact that she'd just laugh. Like, it just wouldn't be seen as taken seriously. Um, so that's something I want to raise. And also, um, just an interesting thing with this police brutality. And I think, you know, when we draw parallels to what's happened in the US and think about George Floyd and stuff, it's interesting to see how those are two different situations that are a result of police, police brutality, but how they've been managed and dealt with differently. Um, and I think it's really encouraging that the world is now listening you know with um and so it's like so many people who perhaps didn't engage with politics are now engaging um but my question is though to what extent is this engagement going to last to what extent are we going to see active changes um because my fear um try not to be pessimistic is just that it's all kind of very high on the agenda. It's, it's high in social media and things like that. But after a few months, is it just going to be something that's kind of brushed under the carpet and then nothing's kind of made upon it? Um, so yeah, those are my questions. Sorry, that's a bit worded long. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. I, I think, uh, let, let me just take this too because uh, it contains quite a lot. Uh, so, 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 so the first thing, of course, uh, that was, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, in 2019, oh, okay, sorry about that, uh, word And uh, so in 2000, uh, the, the 2019 election, uh, the, the, the vote, the number of votes that got uh, APC winning was actually 15,191,847. It wasn't 20 something million, it's actually 15 million. So you can imagine the impact that uh, Nigerians in diaspora would actually make. What we have is that most people don't vote, especially here back home. A lot of people are frightened, frightened away. Uh, the, uh, 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 so much violence is unleashed on people. And so people, and those people are, have voters' apathy where they feel that their vote really don't matter. It, nobody's going to count it. And so what's the essence of wasting their time? They would rather stay at home. And then they have a few people who are coming out who they can easily buy their votes and just give them a few, a few uh, money, maybe like $10 or something and then they are able to get that vote away. So that, that, that I needed to put out. We don't have strong systems in, in, in Nigeria. The way we can get strong system is to have people with character. And how do, how do we have people with character? People who over time, character, Dr. Obeza Kwesili said something that character, uh, sorry, integrity is not complete until it is consistent. Part of the things that we do in Nigeria is that we seem to have a short-term memory. When people do something, we forget. All of a sudden, people who la just last administration, when PDP was in power, who supported the, 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 the government and, and attacked uh, uh, citizens who were criticizing government, today are the ones who are not criticizing uh, the ones in government just because they are out. And then Nigerians, I'm not saying we should not appreciate them. I'm not saying we should, yeah, anybody that comes to criticize them, we should note those things. It's not that we all quickly forget, and then these people come, and they want to be in office, and then we're, we're, we're rooting for them to go on. We have not checked their record and their consistency, and the fact that they change. And then when they get into office, what happens? Definitely they are gonna change. And so we must be very, uh, we, we must ensure we are looking for people with empathy. For me now, empathy is going to be straight on the list. To 2023, I'm gonna check what, what did you say about NSAS? I'm not talking of one tweet. There are some, there are some who 
after people had kept talking to them, they finally did just one apolitical tweet and just being politically correct and all of that. I'm not going to take that. I'm going to see where were you? Nigerians don't focus on people who give their all to them, people who put their lives on the line, people who put their neck out there. They are rather interested on people who treat them with disdain, people who don't care about them. When they are being killed, they never say anything. These are the people that Nigerians care about. There's a Nigerian who went to see the president about something that, that she needed. And she, she had a meeting with the president, yet she couldn't even talk about NSAS uh, protesters. She couldn't even talk about NSAS protests. People were being, the youth were being killed right there. But when we're talking about 2023, same youth who were being killed, where she never said anything, they are putting her name forward for 2023. This is how we bring up people who do not care about us. This is how we bring them into office and they will continue with that uncaring attitude. So until Nigerians need to get to a place where they feel they are wanted, they care, they don't do transfer aggression. They don't, they don't have a misplaced anger where they are angry at the people who are making the mass for them because it seems as if by making the mass for them, you're, you're, they want to assume that everybody is the same. Oh, people, people, yeah, people don't care and all of that. And then when you care, they are angry at you for caring. You know, I always say that Nigerians are in an abusive relationship uh, with their government and anybody that comes to help them out of that abusive uh, relationship, they, they, they would rather come and fight that person and then actually support uh, their abuser. So that's one of, uh, of the ways. We must ensure that we carry people with competence, character, capacity and put them in office and check their track record all over. It's not that, oh, you suddenly had uh, uh, character or you suddenly had empathy. No. How have you been all throughout? Where has your empathy been? Have you spoken when people were being killed in Nigeria? Have you spoken when different things were happening in Nigeria? I don't see any reason why we should be putting in office anyone who has never spoken for us when we are being killed, when we are being beaten, when we are being harassed, when tyranny or brutality is being unleashed on us. So these are the things that we are going to do. And of course, we must have people who, who uh, go into uh, legislative arm because these are the people that we make the, uh, the laws that, we, that will be able to have checks and balances. If we don't have checks and balances, system, system can always uh, be, uh, how do I put it now, be, uh, be set aside in a way or compromised, let me use the word compromised, by leaders who, uh, who don't have character. I mean, we see what is happening in the U.S. today. None of us before uh, the present president uh, came into the U.S. thought that uh, the, lots of the things that we are seeing today would ever happen uh, in the U.S. I watched with amazement where people were boarding their shops because of election in the U.S. They were afraid of maybe there might be spillover of violence. These are the kind of things that you see uh, back in what they call term the underdeveloped or third world. So that says to us that all we need, leadership is everything. And as long as we have the right kind of people in office with character that are incorruptible, then they will be able to, uh, able to, to, to stay in power and not corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There is too much power in the hands of politicians in Nigeria, especially the Nigerian president. It's one of the most powerful presidents in the world. The kind of power that the Nigerian president has. Oh, most of these powers should be taken away from, from one person and be put in, 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 in different places where it will not be controlled by one person and it cannot be abused. So these are uh, some of the things. And then for us to be able to get where we get those strong system is, like I said earlier, checks and balances, our judiciary has to be reformed. We have a major problem there. Many people do what they do because of impunity. Impunity is even worse than corruption and any of, of those things we see over here. People do anything and they know that nothing will be done to them. Even when you're talking about this police brutality, people will say, so uh, police will say to you, oh, we'll kill you, we'll waste you, nothing, nothing uh, is, is going to happen. So that's quite a uh, key. Let me come to the role, uh, to this question from Shea, where she talked about the role to play in Nigeria. And one of the things I will say to you, Honestly, Sheol, it's not because you are you, you, you are a Nigerian that is not born in Nigeria that you're being treated that way. That's the way they treat everybody. Whether you were born in Nigeria, if you told your grandma that you were going to run for help, she would just laugh. It's not because you're out there. It's just the way people are being treated because there's this belief that for you to go into politics, for you to be part of politics, you have to be bad, you have to be corrupt, uh, you, 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 you are not supposed to have character, you're not supposed to have shame, you're not supposed to have integrity. These are the normal people that have been 
that we've normalized to be in politics. And we have to change that. And so it's very important. The role that you play, you play right now is the role of just the way a citizen, because like I say, it's no matter where someone is, no matter the passports, extra passports that you have, Nigeria is still Nigeria. And there's this good feeling that comes from the father. You, the, your, your second country is, a, is, is also a highly uh, developed country. So, so that's, uh, quite, uh, that's quite helpful. And another thing, of course, there's this issue of transfer aggression. Yeah, it does happen where it's, it, apart from even uh, just being born you know, uh, abroad or uh, being brought up abroad, it's even here. We have a situation whereby there is uh, this kind of, there's a social divide between the have and the have nots. And so there's always this uh, feeling that, oh, anybody who has money, or if your parents are a bit middle class or rich, then that means you must have stolen money from government. So there's this simmering anger that has been happening. And over time, because of the kind of educational system we have, let me just digress a little bit to be able to bring context. So in Nigeria, access to good quality education is dependent on the economic status of one's family. So if your family is very rich, you're going to go to very good school. And so people are only meeting people that are within the same circle. Before people from different circles met, whether you're rich or poor, your father is a politician, it's high that you all met in the same school. Now it's no longer the same. Primary school, and, uh, they no longer meet, it's divided. The poor have their own schools, the rich have their own private schools, government schools are for the poor. Secondary school, the same thing. University was a place where people could converge and meet and have a relationship, but that is no longer the case. We now have private universities that you know people with money have to go to, and then the others go abroad. So you find out that it is only as adults that we have a convergence of two different activities coming together. And this is causing a bit of friction. But, but now, Okay, so I was unmuted. I'm so glad that I saw that when it was when it was happening, it was being written. And so, so for the last ten years, I've been saying that look, we're going to have a major crisis in Nigeria because children are are not meeting together. We have that uh, society we are not coming together where they're supposed to meet in school, know about each other, get to know each other. It's no longer happening. And so there's this uh, uh, how do I put a bit of aggression, transfer aggression. So it's not necessarily just because you're abroad. Even if you were here, it, it probably uh, uh, would happen. So uh, so what what I would say is that the contribution we come we come yeah absolutely I, okay Ozzy says to everyone this sounds like a London uh, okay yeah I do agree with you so it, it just to bring a bit of context uh, my my kids uh, uh, my two kids uh, I have two kids anyway so all of them my children went to school at Godinstein and so Godinstein is in like like this posh kind of school and you find out that sometimes even the children out there there was a time my my, my daughter's friend was in a place. And then, you know, some of the kids were like, oh, if they, if they get any of these Godestine students in their posh accent and everything, they're going to deal with them. And she just had to hide herself. So it's the same thing, too, that we have uh, in, in Nigeria. It's really uh, a class system kind of society. Many people don't understand that. Even UK, yeah, it happens there. So that's where you have this uh, half and have not these sentiments, you know, that, that sort of like come over. But I would say this is the time. One of the things you say, say, to what extent will this end? The extent that we are ready to drive it, the extent that we are not ready to give up. I have been a member of the Bring Back Our Guest Movement for uh, since uh, 2014. We started April 30, 2014. It's almost seven, seven years. We've been on the streets every day. We've been making demands, even when they didn't want to listen. So it is the people, the same thing also with the country, is the people pushing it. Are the youth of Nigeria tired of what they are seeing right now? Are they tired of the bad governance? Are they tired of the fact that it's a country that does not give them an enabling environment? Are they tired and ready to make it change? That's the way it should be driven. So there's no one person that is going to come and oh, give it to you, no. Like they say, life is is uh, life is uh, uh, is not a pizza man. It doesn't do delivery. Whatever you want, you have to go out there and get it. And so, every one of ourselves, in our own capacity and niches, must decide that Nigeria is worth fighting for and continue to fight for it. Sometimes people will mock you. Sometimes people will not understand you. You will be called also for all sorts of things. You'll be insulted. But as long as you know what your focus is, you continue to do that. Let me give you an example. I grew up poor. 
And I would go to school in the morning without breakfast. Coming back, I was not expecting lunch. I grew up in a ghetto and I read books and I knew there was a, a word out there and I wanted to escape that, that ghetto. For me, everything I got in my life, it's always been hard, hard, hard getting it. So when people say to me, oh, Nigeria can't work, I don't see that because I've had to work extra hard to get everything that I wanted. When I was writing my SSC, uh, after it's second week, at the end of secondary school, I didn't have textbooks. I was begging people to give me textbooks no, for me to get A. Nobody gave me those textbooks. In school, I, I was fortunate to have gone to a private school. I, did, I was the to finish my homework, not because I'm a good student, but because I didn't have books back home. And so I had to quickly borrow people's books and do them. So I know what it is to fight hard. And that's the reason why, yes, I've been, uh, my first uh, protest was in 1992 in my first year in the university, I've always been demanding, I've always been outspoken, I've always asked for, for my right, and I've always fought for people, but I did it at the level, at my level. And for me, I knew growing up poor, I know what it is in Nigeria, when you're poor, you're faceless, nameless, and voiceless. And I didn't want that. So I concentrated on myself and getting financial independence. That's why I didn't speak on national issues until I was 40. When I turned 40, I realized that I had become the problem of Nigeria. How did I become the problem of Nigeria? By not speaking out, by always, by, by focusing on my business and my life and the people, immediate people, people around me and not, and forgetting that there's some, there's a little girl or a little boy who is suffering the way I had suffered and was angry at adults who never spoke out. And so on my 40th birthday, December 12, 2013, I decided that I was going to speak on national issues. And four months later, a Chibok girl's abduction happened. So since then, I've not given up. I've been talking. Sometimes people don't listen. But in this answer, I met a lot of people during the entrance protest who said to me, oh, Aisha, we listen to your program all the time. Just seeing you, just standing, just going there. I've been at protests where we were just six and we went all the way to, 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 to the villa and did our protest there. I've been at protest, I've done protests alone. I've, you know, so it's all about every one of us giving everything that we have to say, this nation must work. I, I will just uh, end this one here by saying that I made a promise, to, a promise to myself that I will never give up on Nigeria, no matter what it throws at me. Because I want the unborn generation, I fight for the unborn generation the way I wish all this had fought for me before I came to Nigeria. If the generation before I was born had taken it on themselves to fight for a great Nigeria, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't mind fighting for rights of bees to have flowers to pollinate, uh, to pollinate. But here I am fighting for basic rights to be allowed to live. And I don't think I want the urban generation coming to Nigeria to have to deal with that problem again. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, we're just going to take a question from Margaret and um, Ikena. Hello. Hi, Margaret. Um, thank you, um, Aisha. It's really interesting. Uh, um, <laughs> right. So I'm I'm now going into post um, pro the protest and everything because I I myself <laughs> I don't I found it really really incredible moving just seeing a lot of people coming up and speaking up. Mm very, very moving. So countless of people have spoken up about the brutality, um, Nigeria by Nigerian police force and all of those things and, and what's wrong with it and what we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to hear a lot of experts coming up with their own solutions. And that's really um, a warm thing to, for me to hear. So I'm thinking now post the next election, election, and I'm thinking with these great policies, with these great ideologies, with these great philosophies, how do we translate all of those theories into a practical level? How do we make sure that it crosses all the departments, the education, the schools, have, good, or have access to these policies, the health have access to these policies, and they all join up. So I'm talking join up policies. I'm talking community levels. And I'm thinking also, we must, this is the time and we've only got this really, really very narrow uh, um, state to really 
bring everybody in. Who is speaking for the Omodos, for the house girls? Who is, who, who, who is, who is speaking up? for all the voiceless people, the ones who can't speak, who, who have been mar marginalized. Who is speaking up for them? So it just, it just got me thinking, how do we, as a nation, with hearing all these great ideologies and great people of you know, ex experts in all their fields coming up with solutions, 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 how do we practicalize it? How do we practicalize it from the community level all the way to all the departments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take Ekena's question. Um, Ekena, are you there? Okay, we're going to move down the line. I think I also saw a question from um, Adam Apelkin. Um, Adam, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Aisha. Um, so my question was that, what is the background work, aside the main um, action of protesting that needs to be done in order to make protests successful? Because we usually see people go to the street, but what, what is some of the background work you are doing to make your protests successful and to carry the momentum moving forward to achieve change? And then my second question is that um, sometimes uh, we get other people coming into protests and doing things like looting and engaging in acts of violence and doing things that a protest does not want to do. So how do we avoid those kind of scenarios Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have Nguto Jato. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for participating and contributing. Thank you, Aisha, for being there. Um, thank you. My question is, we keep hearing about the system being rigged. Yes, we know the system is rigged. We have a constitution. In fact, that is what I'm interested in. So if you talk about insecurity, the lucky killings, the SARS killings and um, armed robbers, if you talk about bad rules, if you talk about education, if you talk about the healthcare and every basic thing that we know about, it is all contained in the constitution. And I feel when you talk about the system, you're not talking about the atmosphere or, 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 or the, the, the country itself. I know we're talking about the system, what is the system? Are we referring to the constitution? Are we re referring to the polity? And if this is what we are referring to, where do we hit and then hit and get everything? Of course, it's a marathon and um, not a sprint, but um, if there is somewhere we can get all these things are found, like in the constitution, and if we can effect the change from there, so that afterwards, we don't have a system. You know, in one of our meetings, we had Peter Said tell us that this fight has been fought before by the generation before us. And yes, um, to an extent, they won the fight, but some people took over and betrayed the cause. Now, um, these people came into power and they decided to, to, to handle things their own way and, and get corrupt and do things the way they, they have been running things for over 60 years now. Now, if, if, even if we are able to get good, good people to take over now, if we are unavailable tomorrow, how are we sure, how do we get a guarantee that tomorrow, um, the people coming in wouldn't mess up what we fought for again? No, I'm thinking if we are able to change um, what is contained in our constitution, basically we, we would have achieved um, gotten a system that is working for us, and then um, um, when we get people coming in, we are sure that um, even if you are wayward, or if you are not as responsible as we would expect you to be, because um, there is no magical way of, of knowing who is going to get there and perform well um, and deliver or be responsible. Uh, of course, one or two persons will still fail, and yes, we would have to wait for them for four years to, to run out before 
um, we get a replacement. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how we would be able to come okay. together to get. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. I think I get the gist of the question. Thank okay. You. Is is that all of the questions? Uh, yes. For, for now, um, or would you okay. like us to continue? No, 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 no. It, it, it's okay. I'll, I'll take it because I actually even wrote. Uh, there were some questions that are being written in the. So I, I, I got to. Yeah, in the chat room. I, so I went to the chat room. I kept seeing one question that kept, kept coming up. Right. And uh, I, I took some of those. Uh, uh, so I, I think, uh, let me start with the, with, 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 from, the what, uh, from the question. Let me start with the questions uh, by the last uh, uh, caller, or last, the, the person that asked the question, last question. Uh, first of all, you, you, you asked the question and somehow you started giving the answer. You talked about the, uh, the constitution of Nigeria. And in every sense, if we're really going to work on fixing Nigeria, we need to shred the constitution and come up with a new one. It's a constitution that is absolutely lopsided. Part of the biggest problem we have is that con constitution in itself. It was hand, there was, you know, it comes with, are we the people? Uh, okay, I have a copy of the con constitution right, right here with me. Uh, it, it, it was given, uh, us to us from the military and uh, so a lot of the things the way it was done it was done with the military mindset and error and the the, the way they, they just you know everything was just lopsided in that constitution and we really need to do away with it it's a major problem uh, for us let me give you a slight example for example uh, there are there are some people right now who are trying to recall uh, a a house of rep member in lagos state who had called uh, youths that they are always on drug and said a lot of uh, unpleasant words uh, to people after all of these uh, killings that happened in Lagos uh, uh, with, with the, uh, 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 during the EDSAS uh, protest where uh, the government killed a lot of protesters. And yet the woman who is supposed to be a representative was actually calling them drug users and they're trying to uh, clamp down on social media. And people found out that during her birthday, she used the COVID-19 palliative that is meant for people as, uh, she used that uh, as, uh, what was it called now? Uh, what do they keep this? Uh, party favors that, that, that she shared there. So they're trying to do a recall. But one of the problems, the constitution says that for you to be able to do a recall, you need 50% of the registered voters. I don't think there's any election in Nigeria where 50% of the registered voters voted. And that's a major problem. Why do you need to have 50% of the registered uh, uh, voters, when, why, why are we not using 50% of the number of people that voted the person into office? Because in the first place, even our registered voter, many say it's bloated. It's not, uh, it's not a representation of actual figure. A lot of people come in just like what we are sometimes we're doing population, people inflate this figure. So people register because at the end of the day, uh, more people there would meet, they would be able to manipulate and, and use this number. So these are some of the ways that the, the, the constitution uh, it really does uh, uh, affect us. So, in, so that's why most times when you're talking that the constitution has not been able to help in a way for us to have those systems that, that we are looking for. So in terms of the systems, for example, there are certain power in Nigeria, the president has the power to elect, uh, to appoint the IG, the IG of police, even though there's a police commission there, but we know what it is, the IG, uh, elect the, uh, what do you call it now, the chief of all the chief, uh, 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 the security chiefs, and a whole lot of, uh, even, the, even the, the umpire, the umpire of the, uh, of elect, uh, of the electoral body, the, the body that oversees our election, is being appointed by the president. So when the president appoints that time, who's, where is the loyalty? And that's the reason why we have a lot of allegiance is to the president and the ruling party rather than to, Ni to Nigeria and the Nigerian citizens. So this is a major problem. And so this is where we have issues with some of the systems uh, that we have. And we have a situation where when they get into office, they don't want to relinquish uh, these powers that they have because they're enjoying it, they're using it. You can, you can, use, you can militarize election, you can you send the security agents, you, you bring in violence, you, you have the machinery of the state to be able to uh, to to, to uh, put out a violence there, and so these are some of the things uh, that 
that we are talking we are talking about. And then, of course, the judiciary. Our judiciary is not strong at all. Our judiciary is compromised, and so a lot of people know they can get away with anything. You're supposed to have the constitution. There, you're supposed to have the, the judiciary being strong enough to ensure that people are prosecuted. But rather in Nigeria, it is you're punished for good behavior and bad behavior is constantly being rewarded. You have people today who are governors who actually have cases, who have, uh, what do you call it, who have corruption cases in court. For example, the, the, the governor of Bauchi State, he had corruption cases in court that was being tried. And the next thing, he wins, he wins an election, he now has immunity, nothing is going to be done about it. In the next four years, uh, probably he's going to do it again and have eight years of immunity before he comes out. And when they come out, what do they do? They all retire to the National Assembly and sit down there. Our National Assembly, which is the legislative arm of our government, is now the retirement home of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of former governors. And so nothing is being done. Their oversight function is not being done properly. These are people who are supposed to be ensuring that the system is being done, the system is working. But it's, it's not being done. Their the oversight function, they are forgotten about that. They are more focused on what they are going to get. And then when, of course, it comes to the issue of making laws, legislating, they are actually not legislating. Or when they are legislating, it, it's always based on inanities, things, things that are not really important. For example, now, our country where Nigeria is at a place where it is, what we are more concerned about, what our lawmakers are most concerned about is the social media bill. So these are some of the uh, issues that we have. On the issue, on the question about whether when we vote in people, they will not change, they will change as long as we don't hold them accountable. And that's the reason why everyone must be know that the demand side of governance is something that citizens must do. They can't, they, they can't just vote and don't let that go. They can't uh, give a handover, abdicate that responsibility to anyone. That's what we've done constantly. I think uh, there's a saying that uh, Eternal, eternal vigilance is, is the price for democracy, some say. Some say it's the price for liberty. So we must be vigilant. We must check in whoever is in office, whoever it is. The moment the person gets into office, our business as citizens is not to praise that person, is not to clap for the person, is to hold the person accountable and make demands, demands, demands. When the person is done with their tenure, we can then praise them. While they are in office, we have no business praising them. Our business is to constantly evaluate what they're doing, constantly monitor what they're doing, constantly ensure that they're on the right track. Where they are not on the right track, we call them back uh, to, to, to order. So these are some of, some of the things uh, that, that happen. So I'll go to the question where they talked about the uh, the person who asked about how do we avoid scenario of violent uh, hijack in, in situations like uh, you have Togri coming in, and I think we saw what happened with the NSAS prote uh, protesters. They were very, I think they learned all the way everywhere and, uh, and they learned from what had happened to other people and they didn't want that. They saw what happened to 20, Occupy Nigeria of 2012, whereby uh, so, uh, they were leaders and then some people came and then what happened at uh, the government, the NLC and co government was able to buy them over and then the whole protest uh, went, went away. And so, this uh, this one decided no we are not going to have any leader it was a strategy so many people came out to say why why are you not out there why don't you have a leader it's a strategy because the strategy is that they didn't want anybody that could directly be picked out it's not that they are not leaders every this everyone is a leader there there is a team that is working that's why you have immediately got on the 11th of october when government uh, the the IG of police brought out five things that they said what the five things it meant that uh, the task had been disbanded. They immediately brought out their five to five. A week after, on the 19th of October, they brought out their implementation of what five to five could be, what had been done, what needed to be done immediately, what are the short to mid-term uh, things that needed to be done, and then mid-term to long-term things that needed, needed to be done. So they were working. They were actually multitasking. They were negotiating with government, and yet they were also on the street protesting. It wasn't the regular negotiation you have where people will now come, go and sit in a room, and they, no, 
they say, this is our demand. We don't need to be at the table, but we can negotiate with you because it, it's a new order. It's a new world. After COVID-19, many people now realize that they can actually work from their houses and not be in office. People do remote work. You don't have to be in the place for something to be done. So they learned from all of that. And another thing, again, is that they did not allow politicians. They didn't even give room for politicians. They didn't want a situation whereby they would politicize it. They would say, oh, it's because of this. Is this party people that are doing this? No. They just wanted it to, as, to be as organic as, as it was. And they really tried on that. And in terms of uh, violence, you saw what happened. They were feeding people. They were giving, taking care of people. People were coming. Why, why demands were going on? There was fun. There wasn't any violence until government introduced violence. And I say this anyway, and we must be very factual, and we must not allow government to change the narrative, the history that we live. It was government that brought in talks into, to attack NSAS protesters. These talks were carried in military vehicles. They were carried in police vehicles. They were supervised by police to, where they attacked our NSAS protesters, destroyed their cars. The one, one was even burnt at CBN. Our cars were broken, windshields, windows, doors, and everything were broken. Police even destroyed our, our cars, the tires of our cars. On the night of October, when we did uh, the protest, they used their knives to cut, to cut uh, a tire each of the cars we kept. And then on the, uh, on the 10th of, of October, they cut two tires each. So all of this uh, brutality, toggery was done by police. It wasn't done by the NSAS protesters. The NSAS protesters were feeding people. So the talks didn't do anything. They, those that came, they came, some of them came to eat. I remember seeing, it was it a tweet or a, uh, interview, somebody who said, oh, NSAS protesters, you will eat two good meals. This protest will not end. So you see, they were doing all of that. So it is this government that normally unleashed terror. They do it during election, and that's the way they have perpetuated themselves into office. And right now, we need to do something about that terror. And already, it's already happening. Just to answer some of the questions where they are saying post, uh, post uh, the protest, what are the things happening? A lot of things are already happening. Some are already working on the recall of, uh, of a state house of assembly members. Some might say it will not work, but the thing is that if we don't try it, we know. And it's always, I think it's Margaret Mead that said that the world has always been changed by a committed few people who are committed and never are giving up. That's one thing that has always changed the world. So they are doing that. There is creation awareness going on, sensitization, to letting people know about uh, what it is, uh, the youth and other about police brutality and, and all of that. And then there's different empowerment programs that people are thinking about. Because at the end of the day, we need to be able to you to be able to bring the talks also to our side. If the, if the government is paying them to perpetuate uh, our violence, we must find a way of mitigating them for them not to do any violence, to know that all of this fight is for every one of us. So these are some of the things uh, that are being done uh, out, out there already. So in terms of also, there is this uh, uh, people focusing on, on politics, uh, electoral reforms, how to run, getting in the right kind of leader. Like I talk about this, uh, fixed politics, one of the things I forgot to mention about the fixed politics, which launch, the launch is coming up on the 11th of this month, is that there's a school of, uh, of like school of governance where, you know, just training leaders, teaching people how, what leadership is all about, how to be good leaders, how to be visionary leaders, how to be empathetic leaders, uh, and, and all of that. And so, and they're going to take in, uh, quite a number of people getting in just to have that training. Because what we have now, we have people in leadership roles who have no business being in leadership roles. Some of them have just looted uh, public funds. They have so much money, what's the next thing? And they're looking for where they can get immunity. And then they go, in, they go for election and then they win. And they, they, they are there, they are perpetrating more looting. And you know, we all seem to think it's okay. It's not okay. And so just teaching people what a, a leadership role is all about. And they, they are also taught, uh, 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 already um, talk on trying to get a fund, you know, raise common pots, like some people call it, put money together so that we'll be able to help people. Where we have people who have already looted um, our collective wealth, and they bring it, they are called the godfathers. They, they choose who, who are the people who come into office. It is time for us also as citizens to come together and begin to have that capacity to choose the people uh, that, will, that, will, that will run for office. And we ensure we have credible people. People change, yes. But you know what? We will not give them incentive to change. If you are a legislative, if you are a, uh, if you are a member of the legis uh, legislature, 
and you change and you are not doing well for the for the for, for your constituency or for the nation what do we do we recall you mm -hmm. if you are a member of the executive and it's not the person is not doing well we tell the uh, legislature to impeach these are things that we must begin to uh, bring up so that as, at the end of the day there must be an incentive for the people to give good governance right now there's no incentive whether you give bad governance or not if they, you have money to share they will vote for you that has to stop. There is a missing middle in Nigeria that needs to come up and begin to take part in, 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 in politics. The era of saying that, oh, we don't want to do politics is over. And that's the reason why when Atedo at Peter side was talking about the fact that they had fought in the before and all of that, that was the mistake they, they, they made. So during the, uh, uh, during the military era, the people who fought for Nigeria's democracy when it was time to get into democracy, they were nowhere to be found. What happened was that a lot of them thought the, the military were not going to hand over. So you saw what had happened in June 12th election in 1993, and a lot of them were before then, there were a lot of elections that were canceled, and you know, and then at the end of the year, they had that, the presidential election was annulled, and uh, finally before uh, uh, Babangida uh, came down, and Shoneka went in, is it three months after, Abacha, there was this palace school. Abacha came in again. Everybody cancelled everything. So when finally Abacha died, after Salam came into office, many people thought that oh, it's, it's the same, same old, same old. And the people, the competent people that should have been in politics, they didn't go into it. And then you find that I would tell you mostly people, charlatans, criminals, you know, were the ones a good in that 1991. Good number of them that got into people were interested and by the time they got in four years later it was too difficult to unseat them they had brought and that was where they most of them did this all of this uh, uh militarized a lot of youth across across uh across the nation where you have the ones uh, that are not on to Boko Haram here you have the Bakasi boys you have different Niger Delta these this stuff. so they sort of like armed those people and it became difficult for them for to unseat them and they stayed there that was the mistake that uh, the, the generation of uh, Atedo Peter side uh, made uh, uh, at that time. And guess what? The NSAS protesters have learned from that. And they're already talking politics. They're talking 2023 and beyond. They're talking of getting right people into office. We saw what the feminist coalition did. We saw the organization. We saw how they were able to handle, with all the aggression from government, how they were able, able to handle themselves. And so it's, it's and most of them are normally entrepreneurs. Most of them have had to fight a system that hasn't worked for them. The class of citizens that we have in power today, they got everything on a platter of gold. Nigeria was there for them, but they didn't keep that Nigeria for the generation unborn for those of us that came in later. We didn't keep it for the next generation that, that, had, to, that had to come in. So these youth are used to thriving in very hard conditions, and they found niches for themselves to succeed, and yet the government and the nation is still coming after them. So, so like I said earlier, they are used to it, and they're already talking about going into governance, they're already talking about coming together, and they have so Social media at uh, their disposal. They had uh, technology, Bitcoin, how to raise money, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. They have so much that they can do. And one of the things I kept saying to during the protest, the street protest, was the fact that look, you know, it's not, it's not a like I and I used to say to them that in 2014, that was what my husband used to say to me. He would say to me, it's a, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's not a speed because you know them were so agitated. This kid, they need to come back, bring back our girls. I remember, let me just digress a little bit. If you see on my hand, there are two wrist, wrist bands that I wear. I've been wearing this since May. May, uh, May 2014 was when I was started wearing this. The only time I've removed this thing, I think about three times now, was when I had to go into theater for operation and I had to remove everything on my body. What happened was that when I put it on in May, it was shared. I, one of them had uh, something written on, on it almost six, six years after everything is cleaned up. When I put it on, I, I said to myself that I'm not going to remove it until all the girls are back. Honestly, I never knew it would be six years without getting all the girls. I thought something that would be like two weeks. So I made that, I made that commitment. To, I promised commitment to myself. And of course, I can't remove it because that was what I said to myself. I said, until all the girls are back. And if, all, if, if we don't get all the girls back, I might probably die with this in, in my hands because that was what I said. So he kept saying to me, it's, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And even when we're doing it, I kept saying to them, it's not a sprint, uh, it's, it, it's a marathon. You, you just have to keep going and just 
keep working your way. And strategy that they are looking for, it's not even to say strategy now, strategy five years down the line, strategy three years down the line, and they're already doing it. And for me, that's really uh, a great thing. They have learned, not from their own experiences, but from the experiences of others. And that's the best way to learn. Beyond even looking at protests in Nigeria, they've, look, they've been looking at the, uh, the Arab Spring, what is happening in Hong Kong, what is happening in Sudan, uh, you know, and, and, and all of that. I'm putting all, all, all of these uh, things together. So th that, th that's, uh, that's one of the things uh, that will stay there. Uh, so how to practicalize all the action. Practicalizing all the action is actually to do it, doing it. That's, that's just what it is coming out and doing. It's not just about talking and anybody. Do whatever it is that you can do. There's no one person. Sometimes we think that there are a group of people that will do something. No, it's every one of us doing what we need to do and amplify and just keep going on. When you say, you know, doggedness, just be blind focused. As on this matter of Nigeria, we need to have a blind focus. Just be on it. Yes, everybody is telling you to not work. Sometimes your mind is telling you, but just stay on it. That's what we're going to do. And that's what, there's no one person here or there that's going to do. So every one of us doing it. And there are already people who are putting all of this together. You saw when they did the uh, Zoom meeting and the things that, that came out of it, they're already working on it. They're already going on. And uh, you always see the thing from, from time to time. I mean, the five for five demands and all of that, it, it's a team that is bringing it out. Yes, you might not uh, see them, but they all work together and they bring a uh, all, all, all of these are so a lot of back, uh, back, back, uh, background work is uh, is being done and the people are really are uh, working working on that and they're looking it's, it's there's so many things to be fixed at once but on, along the way you just have to focus and uh, um, how do I put it uh, spotlight on some the major ones that you know yes pick up the low hanging fruit but major ones that you know are going to make at the difference at the end of the day. And fixing politics is one of the ways that would really uh, uh, help uh, in, in doing that. Oh, okay, so I talked about like avoid, uh, to avoid violence and uh, rigging, I think. So I'm going to back to the uh, top question that it's there. Uh, let me see now. Can I just pause, oh. pause this for one yeah. second. Um, so we were supposed to close at uh, eight, about 10 minutes ago. I'm going to just give it about 10 more minutes. Um, I know we still have so many questions here. I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to everybody's questions. Um, but I think that in the course of this discussion, a lot of people's uh, questions have also been answered. Um, mm -hmm. This is definitely giving us more food for thought as we are leaving as well. So um, I'll just allow you, Aisha, to continue um, answering some okay. of the questions. I think there's actually there are two people who haven't gotten to ask questions on here too. Let me just see if I can take um, at least two more from the queue. Um, so there is uh, Sakwe. I'm not is it sure how to pronounce that name. Is it? Okay. Good evening. Can you hear me, please? Good evening. Can yeah, you uh, can you say your name? Okay. So yeah, it? I'm so glad to be here. And uh, first thing first, let me appreciate the organizers of this Zoom meeting and then maximum respect to Aisha. It's like you've been at the front line. And thank you so much. Like that we still have people in this generation that can actually speak truth to power yeah uh we are having like first of all i had all the questions that have been asked i've been following up your response has been very fantastic uh first of all let me say that this NSAS protest has really 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 like shift the bar like i always tell my peers i say see no matter what it is stand up against oppression okay mm true to power whenever you have the chance to when you see system adjust whether you know it or not they adjust because it begin to realize that it's not game as usual so there's adjustment that take place knowingly or knowingly adjustments always take place and that is what is happening now people can actually speak or people are now speaking up alongside with this uh, sort of suitcase slogan okay so people are really speaking up so whether you know it or not the the bars has been shifted, so there is significant change mm -hmm. that is taking place. Okay, now I have a very 
serious, or should I borrow the term, so to say critical observation here. I think one speaker called in and then was asking about the constitution. Okay, the issue is we have a very fundamental problem with the system, not just the Nigerian system, the entire African system, but using the Nigerian system here as our case study. We have a serious issue. Even from your analysis, uh, respect to Aisha, your analysis, I can see we, we actually playing that same paradox, or should I say, acting the script of the system that we keep talking about. This is an oppressive system that is put in place and is being perpetuated up till now. How does it succeed or how does this system continue to hold on for this long 60 years after independence? 20, 26 years and 20 years from 1999 till date after the democracy, we keep this system continue to perpetuate itself. It's not by magic. It's because it is structured. And this, the basis of this structured system is that constitution. For instance, you were giving examples. If we bring in credible minds, okay, young and credible leaders into the system, and then they decide to falter because there is no guarantee human beings for the past 2,000 years have not changed significantly, politically speaking. If we bring these people into the system and then they begin to debate, how do we, how do we caution them? For instance, you quote the constitution. The constitution is saying to recall a, a member from the House of Representatives, the uh, National Assembly, for instance, you need 50% to recall that member. But the same uh, vote uh, okay, that so if, if brings this member in, in and then, up to 50%. I'm so sorry. Hello, so sorry, to, because to we have very limited time. Okay. We have limited time, so you could just round up so okay. that we get the next person. Yeah, so I get the question. Okay, the, the point, the, 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 the issue is how can we change this constitution? Because this whole issue we are talking about, for instance, it's present in chapter two of the Constitution of Nigeria, but it is shifted to the, that chapter two is, is non-justiciable, which means you cannot hold the state responsible for yeah. insecurity. Yeah. And all these issues we are talking about boils down to insecurity. If we cannot hold the state justiciable, mm -hmm. if we cannot hold the state responsible for insecurity, then what are we talking about? That means anybody that goes in there cannot actually do anything, or if they fail to do anything, we can't hold them accountable. Because that is what is happening right now. We can't hold them accountable for the insecurity in the country. Okay, so the question is, how do we actually change this? Can we think of a strategy? Now, the front line, the I'm, front, no, I'm, gotten it. I'm gotten the question. We need to move on. I'm sorry. We need okay, to move on. Okay. I'll back <laughs> yeah, out. I'll rest my case at this point. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I've, I've gotten the You say, how can we change the constitution? Yes. Yeah. So can we have the next uh, question, please? OK, can we please ask um, Fati? Mm. Um, Fati? Hi. Hi. Okay. My name is Fati. I'm from, I'm currently living in Medugri. And I wanted to kind of ask Aisha, about a video that I had seen that kind of talked about how the North is sort of complicit and is also not really coming out to protest. I wanted to, for us, especially in the Northeast, I wanted to highlight that we're already a, a fragile state and a lot of any kind of protest or any kind of um unconventional way of addressing trauma is kind of frowned upon because we're in a, almost a, we're in an almost post-conflict state and we're focusing on dialogue and healing and rebuilding so a lot of what the video had said was more of how do we come in as other states who want to support the movement but are not keen on protesting because we have a past of that kind of rioting and po protesting kind of skyrocketing and ending in things that we cannot control. So for me, there's a quote that I really love that says it's not thunder that grows trees, but it is the soft rain. So there's silent revolutions that you, you can have conviction and you don't have to be out on the street. There are many other forms of protesting. And I feel like in the North, we should always look at how the culture is and how the people is, what other forms of activism can we encourage other fragile states to participate in 
without not only with focusing on their trauma and also ensuring that we don't re-trigger them or re-traumatize them by replicating something that has happened to them in the past that has caused, caused so much damage. So what other forms of activism will you encourage fragile states to participate in that shows support to other movements, but is very, very cognizant of the fact that there's trauma on ground that we're still addressing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, so before I come to this uh, last two questions, there were actually uh, some questions that I had uh, written from the from the chat box. And I saw uh, one who was talking about how how to create synergy among the leadership. You mentioned different people, you know, FAS is there, and mentioned a lot of people, uh, Banky W and, and, and all of that, FK Abudu. So the thing is that there's already a synergy going on. Uh, they, are, they are all working together. And uh, it's, it's not just uh, those, those ones that you know, even from uh, some of the organizers uh, across the nation. And one of the things that it did, uh, the NSAS did, was to actually bring people together uh, from different uh, parts, parts, parts of the country. And they're already working on, on all of that synergy, the synergy, because they do understand that if they, uh, if they don't work together, one of the things that the NSAS protest has shown is that there's unity, uh, there's a power in unity. And working together ensures that you're able to do more, you're able to have the voices uh, and be able to have the talent that you, you'll be able to put forward. And you can always put your best foot uh, forward from amongst the many that come out. You can pick the best and, and let them be the ones uh, to lead. Uh, that is uh, one of them. And then the, uh, there was another question that talked about the right youth winning. There's no right youth, there's no right older generation, there's no right anybody. Uh, first of all, it's just uh, because he talked about that somebody had run for election and uh, he didn't win. You know, part of the things I always say to people who run is that don't expect that the first time you run for election that you're going to win. And you find out that most people are not even known. People, people are passionate. For me, for example, I always ask, what have you done for your community? Have you been there? Are you known? Yes, you know a few people. It's not about, oh, I want to now do a, a politics, or I want to serve. You might want to serve the people, but the people don't know of your service. They don't know about you. So you keep going, coming in. For example, if we look at the president, uh, is to say to the president ran for 12 years consistently. Every year, four times he ran for president before he finally won. He didn't give up the first time. He didn't give up the second, third time or fourth time. He ran four times for him to give us the incompetence we are seeing today. So, and you see people will run once and they, they, they are like, oh, I didn't win. I give up. How are you expecting to win? When you're going into an election, the mindset is not, oh, I have to win. The thing is that you're saying to the people, I want to serve you. And it's for the people to agree whether they want, to, want you to serve or not. And so that's one of the reasons why I say it is not we, the electorate and citizens, we must begin to donate to the people that we want and uh, that we feel that they have the competence, character, capacity to run uh, in office. We don't just wait for people to use their own money. I mean, in 2014, I remember some people were like, oh, are you not going to run for office? I'm like me. Even if I run for office, well, I'm not going to use my money. If the people don't bring money to do it, I'm not going to run. Is it me that I'll use my hard-earned money when I'm going to serve you? Of course not. If people use their hard-earned money, what do you expect? They're going to go in there and recoup the money. And so a lot of uh, corruption and all of that uh, will begin to co come in. So it's very important. Yes, you did run in 2019. No problem. Pick it up. Within the four years, you should be there with, with the people. They still see you what you're giving, they should be able to know what your capacity is, not just to say, oh, I'm here, I vote for me. Where are you when they, are, when they need you? Where are you when they're being treated badly? Where are you when they, they need that voice? So we, we'll all be that for them and just keep uh, going. And then when you put in the people, like I said earlier, it's to keep making the demands. Don't vote in people and go and sleep and think that they're not going to do uh, anything. So I think uh, that's from the other question. And then this last two one that I'm going to tell, I think the basic one that was asked by the first of the, the last before one was, uh, how can we change the constitution? Our uh, constitutional review happened uh, uh, a lot of times. The best way to change the constitution is for us to get the right kind of people into the legislative arm of governance, simple. Because it's going to be hard for one of the things I've even been to toying with is the fact that I've been thinking, I think in the last 72 hours, something has been playing in my mind. I'm thinking, should we say to Nigerians, can we 
unofficially come together and actually draft a new constitution for this country. Because we keep saying that this constitution isn't good, uh, we don't need, but we don't have any replacement. Can we even informally, I think Nigerians are, can afford to come together. We have technology, we don't have to meet in a place. We can do meetings. It could be set aside maybe for the next one year, uh, 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 maybe uh, like five hours a week, uh, people meet and they begin to draft all of this together, bring them together so that we can have a loose, we can have an informal constitution to say, this is what an ideal constitution of Nigeria should, should look at. We get constitution law, constitutional lawyers, we get uh, uh, other people around, people who care about Nigeria, different things that I say every teaching that's already say I'm in. You know, I've, I've just been thinking about that because I think uh, nature abhors vacuum. We can't keep saying we don't have a constitution, yet we are not bringing anything that is better. If we have this informal constitution uh, that, that we have there that has been created by really weak people, not that point, because the kind of, even when we do this uh, uh, confab and all of that, it's government that pay people. I, any service that has to do with you are paying people, I'm not interested in it. Because you need to have where people are coming in, they know they are not getting anything. So when they are doing something, it's out of passion rather than how much they are going to be paid. So if you have this with the people actually coming together, we can, so we can meet on social, uh, use different platforms where we can have our meetings. There are Zoom that can take 3,000 people. Sit there, draft this constitution, bring it out and say, this is not the Nigerian constitution. This is what it can look like. But we look at the, the constitution we are using right now. Say, ah, they see this one. This makes more sense. Can we have it that? In that way, we'll be able to change things, even without us being in office, and by demanding for that change to happen. Before you know what's happening, instead of them to go to other uh, countries to go and steal, because our uh, lawmakers actually copy the, everything, they only change the name to our own. They can actually come to this informal constitution that we've already put together, and we'll begin to copy from them and put it in. So the most, the easiest way to actually change the constitution, like I said earlier, is true, is getting people that will go into the legislative and vote at the state houses of assembly and also at, uh, at, at the national assembly. For example, when we had uh, 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 autonomy, local government autonomy, it was defeated in some states. It was in states that it was defeated. That thing was changed, now it's done. We, first, we saw when there was a constitutional change uh, in, 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 in the year ages of those that can run for office, not too young to run. You saw how people went, it took years. That thing is just happened close to 10 years. And for them, they're bad. We just saw the end result. So these are things that, that can happen. If you have the right kind of people who care about Nigeria in office, then that definitely uh, will happen. And so uh, I'm coming now to the last uh, question of the lady who, 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 called, uh, who called in from, uh, from, from Bruno State. Uh, okay, I think we have four mi more minutes. I think I'm good with that. I'm already at the, at the last uh, question. I actually have a program that I normally do 9 p.m. Uh, weekdays. Uh, I mean, I have to send it to tell them that I can't even do that again. But let me just round up on this. I did that video and I saw how a lot of people, you know, the insults that came from the North, uh, how now I am uh, I'm, I'm anti-Islam, I am this, I am that, and people have called that I should be killed. People have done all sorts of things. One of the things that I would like to say to you is that in 2014, when the attacks in Bono were very, very high, guess what brought the attention of the world to Bono? It was the Bring Back Our Guests movement. When 276 girls were abducted and Nigerians finally said, uh-uh, 276, how come? And they stood on the street. That was when the world recognized the atrocities that were happening. There is a difference between protests and a riot. So if you're talking about that fragile state and the fragility of Borno has gone through this, and by the way, Borno is not only the north, it does not east. There are, I mean, there are other states uh, in the whole of, 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 the, of the, hold on, hold on, Fati. So when you're talking, so first of all, I said there's a difference between protest and a riot. So protest, is, and I know protests have happened in Borno. I've, I've seen a lot, of, there are lots of protests that have happened in Bono. What does it mean? People just walk, they go to where they're going to, they say to, this looting that came was not part of the protest. The looting and whatever that came was government bringing in talks and then the talks, somehow they, they, they started de destroying government things and then people saw where their food had been kept, there's hunger, that's a different thing. So, but I do know between all of that, and I, I, I can tell you some of, a good number of the protests I know that has happened are in Bono, but the thing is this, from the issue is that when you're talking about protests, you don't even have to be on the streets. What we did, we did uh, sit out. We met at a particular place to talk on issue. Social media is there. 
I remember when I was talking about the killings that were happening in Bono and, and the Northeast and saying that, look, the president hasn't, you know, people were like, oh, the president had won the war against the soldiers. I said, no, 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 because most, there was a media blackout and most of the news weren't coming up. But we get to hear them. As members of the Bring Back Our Guest Movement, we have people who are there. A lot of people from that Bono would abuse me, would insult me, would say to me, Aisha, we are the ones from the Northeast. You are not the one from the Northeast. So you can't tell us what is happening there. But guess what today? The, the, everything is out in the open. The insecurity is there. So when you're talking about protests, you don't have to be on the streets. Social media is there. You can have a hashtag and keep demanding on social media. The young people, you keep quiet and do nothing. These killings aren't going to stop. Today, they are saying secure not. When the NSAS protest started, all of the people is like, oh, secure not, uh, this one. It's not a competition. It's for you coming out to make demands. And I see people today who are saying that, oh, protest is haram. It's not allowed in Islam. Who told you that? Fighting, fighting tyranny, fighting brutality is what Islam is all about. When we talk about jihad, jihad, like I said, is not to go and kill and cut off somebody's neck. No, it is to fight injustice. It is to fight tyranny. The only place that somebody is allowed to fight back, it is when they come at you. So it is very important for us all to understand that and not to look, you know, you know, the thing is that the Northern governors have come out to say, and they are thanking their imams and their leaders for whipping up religious sentiment and tribal sentiment. But guess what? When you don't come out to do protests, when the youth say, no, they can't come out to do protests, and then there's injustice, guess where that injustice is being? That's why we're having the terrorism we have. That's why we are having the, uh, the banditry we have in the North. That's why the kidnapping that, have, that started in the South South has not taken another devilish dimension in the North because people are not allowed to voice out their voices peacefully. So what happens? They begin to do it in an illegal way. And that's by coming out at the society because there's anger. The insurgency, I grew up in Kwanahu. I grew up in, I was born and brought up in the North. I grew up in Kanu. I grew up in Kwanahu. I grew up in a ghetto. I grew up where there was poverty. People weren't going to school. By the age of 11, all my friends were married off. Age 11, my friends were married off. Where I grew up, like 70 to 80% of the youth were on drugs. As you see me, I, I'm sure maybe you saw one of the, this is where I did that, chow, 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 chow. You know, people were like, that's where I grew up. I grew up among hoodlums. And so I know, and I grew up in a society where somebody will say to you, can you please borrow me some money? The next riot, I will pay you. The next riot, all the riots that have happened that we've seen in recent uh, uh, time in the North, in the South, it's not something that normally happens, but it's something that happens like this in the, in the North. I grew up in Canada. When Lagos State Governor was saying that he couldn't imagine that such rioting will go, I said, because you didn't grow up in the North. I grew up in the North where in the twinkle of an eye, there will be destruction, there will be looting, there will be burning. And there are people who lived for those things because they had nothing. These are people who at the age, some of them at the age of three, were sent out as al on the streets. They had nobody caring for them. They got no love. Their parents threw them on the streets. They grew up in the street. They got people who came at them which, you know, they saw inhumanity at its worst. So when they grow up, burning properties means nothing to them because they were never shown love or empathy. They were never shown humanity. Killing somebody means nothing to them. So where the youth I grew up with would say to you, borrow me money, the next riot. So when Nigerians were saying that, oh, they can never be suicide bombers, I used to say to them, no. If you grew up where I grew up, if you saw people who had nothing, who didn't have anything in life, who had no parents that showed them love, who were not sent to school, who were not, they ended up not learning the Islamic knowledge they were supposed to learn. They ended up with no trade. They grew up as adults, they are practically useless. People see them, they are disdainful of them. The only time they are important is when they hold a weapon and then people fear them. Let me tell you something. Growing up in Kwanahudu, as a young, as a young, as a teenager, a lot of parents didn't want us to mix with their children because we're the children from the wrong side of, of, of town. I, I remember that uh, uh, they, they, some people, if you say to them, you're from Kona, they're instantly afraid of you because it's a place where there were hoodlums, where drug addicts and, you know, all, all the things, talks and, and whatever we grew up there. So I know what it is. But you, you say one thing is that, Patty, one of the things I would say to you is that you need to understand that there are a lot of people who are not educated. And the education that each and every one of us have it's for millions, it's not just for us alone, it's for millions of others who, would, who do not have a voice to speak. 
And that voice, we must speak. If you're not on the streets, you can be on social media. You can start hashtag. Hashtags go very far. You can begin to send things represented and say, these are the things that we want. You can do, oh, today we are not going anywhere. Everybody stay at home. All of these are, are protests. Don't go anywhere. Just stay at home. Or, or like what they do in Brazil at 12 o'clock or 1 p.m. or something. Let's all bring out our pants and begin to hit our pants. We're being killed here. But people are not talking. We have a situation where people are ready to fight for God, but they, are, they leave their fight to God. When you ask them to fight for their right, they will tell you that it's not allowed in Islam. But they are the ones that at the slightest they will be killing in the name of God. They will just be, they will be, it is murder in the name of God. But yet stand for your right, fight for other people's right, fight against brutality and tyranny. Uh, ty tyranny. They will say, no, they don't want to be. So they, as much as possible, sitting down and just doing nothing and say, oh, that's how God wishes. No, that's not how God wishes because we like to abdicate our responsibilities. And I always say that Nigerians think that they have the patent to pray us. They do nothing. They abdicate their responsibilities to God. God will not do for us what he has given us the capacity to do for ourselves. And right now we have everything to fight for good governance, to demand for accountability, to demand for transparency, and not just sit down and allow people just, just, just do anyhow. And people are suffering. People are being killed. I saw the way people from the North came after me, demanding that I be killed, demanding that people should hurt me, demanding that, oh, whatever it is, they let, let them do it to me. I didn't see them making those same demands on Sheikha, the leader of Boko Haram, that has been killing people over the years. For over 10 years, Boko Haram has been killing people in the Northeast. Bandits are killing people in the Northwest. Killer headsmen are killing people in the North Central. I didn't see the North coming out to, to make demands on this. No, but they made demands because Aisha is the one make, uh, make, make, making demand on the government. The same people who today tell you that protests uh, they can't do it. It's not allowed in Israel. In 2014, 2012, they were actually protesting. Then because why? It was another person from another region that was president. Today, because their own son, their own person is the president of, um, commander in chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, they're ready to look the other way. That's not the way it is. We must always be consistent in making demands. Whoever is in office, we must make demands from there. I'm from the South South region, born in, 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 the, in the northwestern part of, of Nigeria. Jonathan was from my region. It didn't bother me. He wasn't giving good governance. He was allowing people to be killed without him saying anything. I had to speak out. Buhari is, uh, is we're the same religion. It doesn't bother me. It is all about it is all about the fact that he's not given the right kind of leadership, and we have to speak out. So please, as much as possible, like you said, different ways of protest. Yeah, there are different ways. Even if they cannot be on the street, they can do something. Hashtags are very important. Start something. For example, I asked the question the other day. As soon as the end starts. Uh, uh, hashtag went out the secure note. People that will say, Oh, why are you talking about NSAT? Oh, you should talk about secure note because secure note has more problems. But that, that's uh, that's uh, how do I put it now? Um, there's this mentality of uh, oh gosh, uh, oh, my I've just lost the word in my head, but you know, uh, and, and exactly entitlement mentality that's what I'm looking for. It's an entitlement mentality that should be done away with. You can't just sit down and wait and not say anything when you're being attacked, when you're being killed, but you expect other people to be the one to always be talking for you. And then, when for once they come out to say, Oh, we're being killed on this, and it's just to say that, Oh, that really doesn't affect us, this one should be more. No, at the end of the day, we are all a nation. Anything that affects any region in Nigeria affects all of us. So that's why even when people were telling me, you are not from the Northeast, we from the Northeast, everything is okay. I said, no, everything is not okay. And I'm going to talk about it. And that's the way we are going to be. So we have to do that. And injustice to one is injustice to all. Terrorist attack to anyone, anywhere in the world is terrorist attack to everyone, everywhere in the world. And we must ensure that we are speaking together for humanity. People that want to truncate humanity will not allow it. And most importantly, we must ensure that we we hold people in government accountable, accountable, whoever that person is. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining me today. And thank you so much to, uh, to the African Society, Cambridge University. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. God bless you. Um, honestly, this has just been incredibly energizing. I mean, I'm here. I'm just, you know, ready to go out. I talk too much. So if you leave me, oh. I could talk for the next 12 hours. <laughs> no, this, <laughs> is, this, 
This has been wonderful. I've already received a lot of um, messages saying thank you, um, thank you. For, for, for you just being here and sharing um, your wisdom and your ideas with us and just engaging us, really. I'm so glad that so many people were able to come in and ask their questions and, you know, really have us running with ideas on what to do next. Um, Can I sneak one question in? Uh, we are way past time. We are, we're really way yeah. past It's a very small one, but so, fair so what will happen? Let them write it. You could send it to me. Then I could answer it and send it back to you and you okay. place it back. Thank you. So that, 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 would would that would be great. So, um, I'll just put in, I'll put my email onto the chat. Yeah. So if so any, they'll send you the thing. I could just do, it could be a video. I'll just answer the question, send them back to you, put it on your YouTube and they could go and watch it there. Yeah. Yeah. Alternatively, you can also follow our page, um, the African Society of Cambridge University page right there. I've just put the link mm -hmm. in the chat. Please follow us. You can post your questions there as well. You can message us um, and we'll make sure that um, Aisha gets your questions as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We know that you have other things you could be doing this evening, but you've all been here invested in um, the progress that Nigeria is making and will make in the future. So thank you so much, Aisha. I hope to- Thank you, Debbie. Thank, thank you. And soon. Um, all right. So I'm just going to say good night to everyone. Please stay safe and take care. Um, please remember COVID is not over. Let's all continue to protect ourselves with that as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Asher. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Good night. Good Thank night. You. Bye. 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 Bye.